It is a privilege to live for Jesus Christ in 2023. As we look at the end of this closing of this year and the beginning of next, I could do nothing but anticipate and expect that every day the Lord is opening new doors for this church in Chelsea, Oklahoma. I'm thrilled by each step of progress that the church has made. You have made in individuals. You have made in your homes and your families. You've made in your workplace. The improvements that are done on the church are just uh, speak loud and clear of a church that is anticipating the Lord to do exactly what he promised he would do. Amen. I thought of the other day the long list, no doubt, I don't know them, of all the prophecies and the words of exhortation that has gone forth in this city throughout the years of God having a church here. And uh, you need to look at yourself today and say, I am a recipient of all of the promises of God. Amen. It's not what the church is going to become, it's what the church is today. That's my point. Amen. Amen. Turning your attention to this morning, I'll just read one verse, Proverbs 23, 23. Got to be able to remember that one, Proverbs 23 and 23. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Of course, my focus today is on buy the truth and sell it not. And this is the topic I want to preach about today. Judas really did have something to sell. Judas really did have something to sell. Lord, I pray that you would bless today. Whenever we hear the word Judas, Lord, I suppose it stifles the air in the room. But I, my intention, Lord, is simply to preach, oh God, your word today. I pray that you bless each and every one. And Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, I pray that through all that is said, we would become all that you want us to be, that we would not miss the mark, but that, Lord, we would be on target with you. Pray your blessings today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Buy the truth and sell it not. You could be seated. The disciples never seemed to pick up or were, by any scriptural text I can come up with, aware of Jesus treating Judas any different than the other 11. That means we, that needs to be something we preach about all by itself, that... that God is not a respect of persons. We think of that sometimes as, well, why can't I have what they have, right? But let's take the opposite side of this and just say today, even Judas, the Lord was there working with him and reaching for him every day of his life. Judas Iscariot means an inhabitant of Kiroth. Um, We really know nothing about Judas' life up until the Lord called him to be one of the twelve. I don't know anything about his past. I don't know anything about his education, about who he knew and, you know, religious scene. I don't know much about him other than the fact that simply that he had some kind of financial ability to keep the bag. His call to worship, his call to discipleship, excuse me, was something that simply the Lord called each of those men and each of them said yes. I don't know Judas's motives early on in his ministry. 
I want to believe that probably he meant good. He wanted to be upright. Just something about what the bag offered. The possibilities that were additional above and beyond his own ability and finance. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the clout that he had with people around that, that knew that in a dire situation they might be able to go to one who may not have had the authority, but he had the bag. He was receiving a money. All we know is that somehow the bag had holes whenever Judas had it. And yet we don't see the change in the Savior. We don't see a God who says, I'm going to get you. I'm watching you. Got my eye on you. Mess up one time and I'm going to, you're going to be scorched earth. You're going to be grass that dries up a little quicker than normal. I don't know about Judas' offspring, if he had a family. All I know he was called and given a possibility in his life, an ability to be able to say, I want to be a steward. I want to handle the things of God. I don't know if somehow he could take that bag, a uh, physical coin, uh, the money purse that Judas kept for the 12, and somehow he was able to, in his mind, dismantle that this was different from his call as one of the 12. Maybe it was different from his responsibilities as one of the twelve, and so he felt like he had the, the right to help things out. Simply, the Scripture states that he was a thief. It wasn't this accusation of the Lord to say that Judas was a thief that really got him in trouble, though, was it? It wasn't the end of the story. When the end of Jesus' ministry was coming to a close and no longer was he out there, you know, raising the dead and, and changing the water into wine and doing all those exceptionally exciting things in the community, but now uh, things had turned and now people were looking down and now he wasn't as welcome and now he wasn't in the middle of things. He was... He was uh, on the outskirts of things. When Jesus could say to his disciples, will you go away also? And Peter said, Lord, where would we go? Who else holds the keys to eternal life? Here's what John says in John 6, 68 through 71. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Somehow, within Judas, somehow he could dismantle his calling and, and compartmentalize aspects of his life. It was okay to do this. It was, he had to be this as one of the twelve. And, and, and somehow through all of that, it's as though Judas lost his credibility of his trust and his confidence in God. It's as though that Judas began to have the beat of a different drummer. It's as though he became segregated or separated from the others. He was not usually found to be in the center of conversation with the other disciples. He was not simply one who was there. When we look at the town, the story of Bethany, when Jesus came, and that was what our Sunday school lesson was, as I mentioned this morning, it's very possible that when Jesus rebuked Judas and said, don't trouble the woman, 
when she took that box of spike dirt and broke that seal and began to anoint Jesus' head and his feet and, and, and wept at his feet and washed his feet and dried it with her hair. And Judas said, what's going on here? Do you know how much money we could have had in the bag? you know how many people we could help? It's like he lost sight of the purpose of God, the calling of the Lord in his life. It's as though church was every day in his life, and yet it didn't have the meaning it was meant to have. Judas, we see him protesting the costly perfume. Could not this have been sold and given to the poor? Oh, how far he was from the will of God as he said those words. We think of the betrayal of Jesus now. It's as though Judas could fool the disciples. We don't ever see them saying anything against Judas for his ways. He, he deceived them. They thought he was just one of the guys. But secretly, he could bring together the chief priests and officers. Secretly, he could plan the outcome of a confrontation with Jesus. And he could use that time with Jesus as Mary fell at his feet to hear the word. As Mary fell at his feet to lay her burden upon the Lord as Mary fell at his feet and and worshipped him. Judas is conniving that the next time I'm with him, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to manipulate the situation. I'm going to make it to where this thing's going to pay off. Couldn't get any money for the spike dirt, but I'm going to get money from the priests. I don't know if Judas thought that maybe Nothing would ever come to pass or somehow Jesus would walk through the crowd and, and, and would be hid. I don't know if he thought that somehow something would happen by his majesty and his great power that, that somehow the Pharisees and the soldiers wouldn't impact and touch his life. But for whatever reason, Judas, the man who had the beat of a different drummer, manipulated and brought the situation. Look at the Last Supper. Who knows how close Judas laid against the Lord, possibly beside John as he leant upon his breast. How tidy and clean and neat he was, how part of the group he was, how important and appreciating one another. And yet here he was, waiting for the right timing, just waiting for the right moment to hatch his evil plan. I'm not preaching this message today. To, I'm not going to at the end of the service say, Judas, are you here? I'm not trying to be evangelistic at a, at a youth rally right now. I'm here to talk to you today about Judas had choices. Here they are at the foot washing, and Jesus is cleaning. Peter rebukes him and said, Lord, you'll never wash my hands or my feet. And Jesus telling him, of course, you know, if you don't, then you have no part or lot with me. Hearing the warnings of Jesus, as he said, yet though one of you who is here that I'm going to wash his feet is not for me, but against me, he's a devil. You see, I just see the grace of God permeating in this story. A God who loves Judas. A God who wanted the very best for him. A God who was ready to do whatever he needed to do. He he knew that when he went to the cross, it would be for Judas. If it would allow him to. I hear the disciples saying, 
Lord, is it I? Is it I? Surely not me, Lord. And Jesus would say, the one that I give this up with. And there at the end of the moment of the night of the great last supper, Jesus could say to Judas, what thou doest, do quickly. I don't know where choices stopped and hopelessness began. But that is the outcome of not taking advantage of the choices that God allows you to have in your life. We think it's just another day, just another year. I've got until I'm 86 before I croak. Or whatever number you want to use. <laughs> but that's not the way this works. Here in the garden, as Jesus is there praying and his disciples with him, now separated, and in comes Judas Iscariot with a band of soldiers and high priests and Sadducees. And somehow Judas, to do away with any possibility of missing where the Lord was or who he was, he said, I, the one I kiss will be the one. He's the one. They obviously didn't have Facebook and, and Internet at that time. The complete betrayal, the plan that he had, premeditated murder. But I'm not referring to the man being simply crucified as much as I am talking about the premeditation of somehow severing something that we have that we think is a light thing. And we don't need Jesus anymore. And if I deny him, there will be greater gain than if I walk with him. As so the accompaniment of the bands of soldiers come, the kiss of deception goes forth. And Luke twenty two forty eight 48 simply says this, But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? I know somehow in the big picture that Jesus... There had to be a plan whereby someone would betray him. But as Jesus said, woe be unto the one who brings offense to one of these little children. He said it would be better for him to have a millstone wrapped around his neck and cast into the sea. Oh, the remorse that sit in that man's life. The guilt and the shame that overcame him. It was more than he could bear. He ran back to the priest in the temple and took those 30 pieces of silver and cast it down at their feet and said, I don't want it. This money has cost me more than I ever knew. I have paid a price for something I could not allow myself ever to give up and let go of. So now truth that day was taken from him. Somehow, when you manipulate Jesus, you manipulate the word. Even his money now can't be accepted by the priest for it's dirty money. It's filthy. It's connected with murder. And so they won't even pick it up. I wonder how and one by one those coins left that place if the priest didn't touch it. That tainted life now. Judas' life is now no different than the money he threw down. It didn't get the outcome he needed. No one can use it. And so they took up the money and they bought the field where Judas hung himself.
The Bible simply says that he went and hanged himself. The book of Acts says it like this, that he went to his own place. He went to his own place. I don't, know, I, I don't know if I've done a good enough job today, but I'm, what I'm trying to show you is how that step by inch, here a little and there a little, one decision after another, the, the Lord was faithful to him. The Lord was good to him. He had every promise. Nothing was deta detached from him. Nothing was taken from him. The Lord didn't say, because you did that, I'm going to do this. But his mercy reached for that man. His kindness was with him. His kind words were there with him and affirming him. His disciples were never shown the truth of who he was. They were so caught off guard and as they laid at Jesus' feet, they said, Lord, is it I? Another would say, is it I? Lord, is it me? None of them knew it was Judas. I'm telling you today that we as human beings, we are trudging down a path of faith or faithlessness. We are walking down a path today where we are allowing the Lord to touch our life and we are touching Him. Or we are becoming those who put up walls and are operating by the drum of a different drummer. It's here today that I have to preach for just a moment. I, will, I don't need to be a lot of words. I've already said enough. But choices have got to be weighed today by the truth and sell it not. How do we sell the truth of my life with my choices? We don't go out to someone, hey, give me a million dollars, I'll give you my, my, my faith. But each day, we allow Jesus to distance himself from us. Every day, we allow there to be a wall of something more important in our life. Every day, we make choices that don't allow us to live for God like we really need to. Oh, what's it doing? It's hurting you. Judas, whatever happened to your purpose God gave you? Whatever happened to the thing that God meant you to be? Judas, Judah in Greek. He was supposed to be the house of praise. He was supposed to be a thankful one. He was supposed to be one that could give praise and glory and honor to God. But through choices, my friend. Just one step here, one step there. I don't know how long he formed this premeditated decision he had made. I don't, I don't know. All I know is I, I kind of think that according to the Scripture, there came a time when Judas was around a priest, uh, and, he, and he said to them, what will you give me if I sell my truth? man who should have been a warrior, an angel of light that would shine forth the praises of God within the lives and the hearts of men. And we see someone who denied the Lord, rejected the truth, and belittled it so much that he was willing to allow it to slip through his fingers instead of truly, it's truly giving his all to God. Would you stand? I just want you to know today that God has a purpose. And our job in this life is to find out what that purpose is. Our job is to go through life trusting his word, gathering ourselves together, being a church that will represent Jesus Christ to our community. And God calls us to be here to do and be faithful in the little things, and he will reward thee greatly. 
even among the tares, to be good wheat, Renee. Be faithful. It's not to the end that the tares are bundled up and burned. So, sometimes we put too much worry about what's wrong, not near enough worry about what's right in our walk with God. I'm preaching today that our actions truly do speak louder than our words. I'll follow thee. I'll go with you. I'll take thee all the way to death. Oh, Peter, don't you know in just a little bit of time <laughs> you're going to become the cousin of the high priest of the year. <laughs> just a little bit of time. You're going to be running for your life. And that's going to be you, Peter, that denies the Lord three times. Jesus waited for Peter after the resurrection. There with the coals of fire on the shore and the fish and the bread. The disciples have been out all night trying to fish because they're fishermen and they haven't cost up the coffin thing. And he could yell out to them, have you any meat? And somehow Peter perceived that was the Lord. Well, Peter grieved. Peter repented. Peter was sorrowful. But Judas had nothing to hold on to. Judas had no truth left. He had sold it. But Peter, Peter was beat up. Peter was hurt. Peter made some really stupid mistakes. But Peter had his faith. And he saw the Lord. And he took off his outer garment and he dove into that water before the ship could ever come to shore. And he swam to the Lord. And he fell before him. My friend, it really does matter today how you treat the Lord in your life. It's not just church once or twice a week. It's a lot more than that. It, it's allow us, what, what gets in the way of, of your walk with God? What are you allowing today to become so important that you're willing to say, church can wait. I need this more. What happens in your life? Your finances goes to everything but. Your commitment to the Lord is minimized. Let me call the church today to a place where Judas could be the greatest story you've ever heard. Why? I've always thought Judas was a pretty negative story. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but, but maybe today I presented it to you, I hope, in a way for you to realize that we're not here to beat you up. I'm here to let you see how it was a number of things that happened where Judas mishandled who he was and who Jesus was in his life. And through those choices he made, it automatically made the Lord to be in a position where he was no longer valuable until one day it would be more valuable to deceive than it was to come in honesty and be real. And that's what I'm preaching to this church today. God wants you to be real. He wants you to learn to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. He wants you to make church real in your life. The forefront of everything you are and do. He wants you to win a soul and be blessed unbelievably by your interest in another person. He wants you to be able to lift up your hands and receive the blessings of God through praise and worship. He wants you to be able to petition and pray at an altar and know that God is going to meet you there because you have a faithful walk with him. You're, you're committed. You're tied together. Don't have to wonder if the Lord's going to be here. I know when I meet him, he's right there. That's what I'm preaching today. Judas had choices. Proverbs 23 and 23, buy the truth and sell it not. This altar today, 
whether you're comfortable where you are down here, but I'd like us just to seek the Lord for just a few moments. I wish somebody could say, Lord, I'm going to do better. I'm going to draw closer to the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's such a commendable statement in the scriptures. Would it be awesome today if a family could say, come on, let's bind together. Let's be what God wants us to be. Let's just make up our minds today and agree. By the will of God, we are going to be all the Lord wants us to be this year and on into next year. Amen. Would you pray? Would you seek him right now? What is your purpose today in God's kingdom? I promise you it's to praise Him, to be thankful unto Him, to bless His holy name. And so enter into the house of God with a with a newfound confidence and boldness that God is going to do great things through your life. When you come to the church, I, I want you to come not only knowing that God wants to give you something today, but also that you want to leave something today of your thankfulness and praise where you truly give God honor. I think maybe Judas may have done better if he just knew his purpose and he had done it. it might have helped him not to fall into those slippery places. David said, my foot and nigh slipped. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, yeah, 
it's easy to look around us and see things better elsewhere, isn't it? And David said, but then I made my way to the house of God. And I saw the end of what they're doing. No matter how pretty their house is, no matter how nice their shiny new car is, I saw the end. And just let David know more than ever, I'm going to be what God wants me to be. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I, I um, think about this message. I hope I haven't, you know, attacked you. This is my intention. But, oh, I'd like you to be able to walk out of here and chew on this this week. God, help me to make good choices that are always drawing me closer to God, not farther away. God bless you.